studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. We begin this evening with part two of our two-part conversation with Jeff Fager, looking at 50 years of 60 Minutes. And you've had conflicts between correspondents, too, have you not? There's always a conflict between yeah. correspondents. Well, sometimes, it, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, well, is it because of they're, they're in competition? But also, sometimes one correspondent will get upset with another for whatever reason. It's, I think it's more collegial than people realize. I think the conflict is part of the reputation that comes from Mike Wallace. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh, you know, we're... We're kind of famous for being, a, 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 you know, a tiger pit, and yet he was the tiger. He was the, you know, the biggest cat of all, as Dan Rather told. He was Steve he prowl, prowl, he prowl the halls, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> looking. looking for trouble. <laughs> and uh, but it is a pretty collegial place. It's just that I think the competition is people want their stories yeah. to be the best. Oh, but I mean, you keep the correspondents to strong standards, and I mean, and if they have not done that. Yeah. In any way. Yeah. There, it's a responsibility a, there's, uh, to remind people. Yeah. Sometimes. And there's a code up there code. in terms of, you know, how, how we collaborate. And yeah. it is an ensemble, after all. And I think everybody respects that. You know, there are people who came and went who preferred to have their own show. Right. And uh, the people who stayed respect the ensemble of it. It's important. It matters. It's part of what makes us what we are. You, you know, it, 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 that happened to me. I mean, I have essentially worked as a single solo player. Yeah. And people, when I went to 60 Minutes, said, well, you know, this is an ensemble. You, yeah. Is that for you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I learned. And, and they also wondered whether I was right for the form at the time. Yeah. You know, it turned out pretty well. It turned out very well. It's an amazing body of work when you look back on it. It's a lot of stories. <laughs> but at the same time, you learn, you, you treasure the collaboration. Yeah, you, you do. You treasure it. Yeah, you do. You know? and, 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 you know, Because somebody will make your piece better. There's nothing I want is to have the single best piece. You know, I'm, all of us, every correspondent there and every producer there wants their piece to be considered the single best piece. Yes. In every way, among your colleagues, among yeah. yourself, on the ratings, in your eyes, yeah. and everybody. Yes, and they all know there's reward in it. Yeah. If you have a, a terrific story on Sunday night, there's an extra ration of rum. They yes, all know that. exactly. And we know how much we love rum. And there's a victory yeah. lap. A couple of people I want, I want to mention, too, because they're part of this. One is Allison Pepper, who you're great, great, who's been there yeah. with you. It's in a sense, is someone you can go to who you know knows what's going on. Yeah, well, she knows you, so much. And, and, you know, so among the many strengths that Allison has brought to 60 Minutes over almost 20 years is that she can hire just the right person for the right job. Right. And, and that's an amazing talent. Uh, she knows the place so well. She knows who will fit where. She knows how to find a good reporter. She knows that a kid who's coming out of school, journalism school, she finds them somehow. She knows and, the culture and she knows who will fit in the culture. And brings in amazing people. Yeah. And, and there are a ton of really young, uh, excellent reporters at 60 Minutes. Other people, we talked about Bob Simon. Uh, Bill Stop. Owens. Bill uh, Owens. You know, Bill, Bill Owens is the number two. He's been with me now for many years, and he was a producer for years. He's the classic example of someone who understands 60 Minutes because he's been out in the world so much. He's done everything. Everything, and he did it brilliantly. Um, you became um, chairman of CBS News. Yes. Mm -hmm. Me and you were the CEO. Of CBS News. Of CBS News. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you do that? <laughs> It's a Mike Wallace question. Uh, it's a good Mike Wallace question. I, I was frustrated uh, with CBS News, and I think part of what frustrated me was the morning program. You know, for years and years, uh, it was reinvented, cheaper than the one before it. I hate to say that for the people who worked on it. I know they cared and tried hard, but it, it was a cheap imitation of the Today Show. And I never understood why, with our history and our heritage, why wouldn't it be an imitation of CBS News? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we want to be covering what's important and doing what we care about at 60 Minutes? Those values that I think stand out so much. So Les asked me, Leslie Moonves asked me to be chairman and to hire a president. That ended up being David Rhodes. We worked incredibly well together. And one of the first hires we made was Chris Licht. Right. And Chris Who came in. the executive and, producer of the, uh, CBS This Morning. CBS This Morning. And, and there we have it. With a brilliant producer like that, we were able to create a, a new version of morning television, you know, and people weren't sure, well, Charlie Rose, really? <laughs> yes. In the morning? I mean, you know, and yeah. it was amazing. And, uh, and yet... Uh, 60 Minutes, yes. His own show, yes. But the morning? Morning? And, uh, you know, Charlie, I knew that you were perfect for that. And I think everybody was a little skeptical. 
because of all you were taking on, but that you're so well read in in life. You you know the stories of the world, mm -hmm. and you you don't need to spend a lot of extra time uh, to do the morning program in terms of preparation. So, and I think it shows. Yeah, it is the same read in. It really yeah. is the same read in. Yeah, and so then you know, uh, Gail joined right away, and I, I, that was a Chris licked uh, had the idea of Gail and. She, just as soon as I started listening to her radio interviews and, and, and the other journalism that she was doing, I realized that's, a, that's an inspired choice. And then Nora joined, who right. I think the chemistry, the, 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 yes, combination, the chemistry <laughs> and the combination of, of yeah. talent and people who are serious minded yet know how to have a laugh, right. which is really was you our... You can't what, make that up stuff. No. You can't make chemistry up. You've also had this tradition uh, at 60 of contributing correspondents. I started as a contributing correspondent. Yes. Anderson Cooper. Yeah. Who has another job. Yeah. As I do. But does 10, 9, 10 pieces? 12. 12 pieces? Yeah. The other is Bill Whitaker, who you added several years ago. I mean, he does 20, 30. Yes. How many stories does Bill do? He's a workhorse. A he, guy he, who's he, come to this broadcast and looks yeah. like a natural. Yeah, he is a natural. One. He is. He's wonderful. You know, I think uh, what I love about Bill is what has worked uh, with so many people that have come to 60 Minutes. He's a, a veteran CBS News correspondent who has covered every kind of story. Domestic and, and international. Everywhere. He was based in Asia for a while. He was based in L.A. for a long time. He's just an amazing pro. And it shows when he gets a hold of a story. You know, he did the opioid story with Ira Rosen, and, and uh, it was uh, so well done. You know the implication of what you're saying, that these big companies knew that they were pumping drugs into American communities that were killing people. That's not an implication. That's a fact. That's exactly what they did. You know, he's a natural for us, and I think a big part of it is because of the level of experience, but he hit the ground running. And I think it, um, you know, it came as a shock that uh, the intensity of it all, and he has, he has been more than up to the uh, challenge, and I think has really excelled. He loved it, I can tell you. He does he love he it, loves yeah. It. That's he why he does it. so much. I think you can feel that on the air, by the way. Um, Oprah, uh, <laughs> my colleague Nora O'Donnell. Nora. So, Sherry Al Sharon Alfonso, you know, Alfonso. Yeah. You know, how David Martin will come in, as yeah, now, he did brilliantly <clears throat> in a recent piece. David's been contributing, uh, starting with me at 60 Minutes 2. Right. Actually, he did Schwarzkopf for Don Hewitt uh, right. in, uh, you know, First Gulf War. But... Uh, What's the theory? See, for me, it's the... You are sort of the, I think, the symbol of that and why we should do that. Right. We wouldn't have I was Charlie... I who started it because I refused to give up the show. Correct. And then, now, it so worked. It, it worked, worked in every way that we didn't even imagine it working. So I'd rather have Anderson Cooper yeah. and have him doing his program on C CNN than not have him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Anderson loves being at 60 Minutes. He just loves it. And he, he's another amazing work ethic who will give up weekends, which he's doing this weekend in Puerto Rico for us uh, with Tanya Simon. And they're going... I'd, I'd rather have him than not. So then Oprah's the same way. Right. And Nora as well. Uh, the, I think that the contribution from the contributors uh, is significant enough to uh, justify it beyond that. I think we're better because of them. So 50 years and counting. What do you worry about? That nobody's going to know what the hell a stopwatch is. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's a funny thing, but uh, you know, I, I guess what I worry about that uh, is guarding the values, and you know, there have only been two of us that run it, and that's a little bit, um, uh, you know, that's important, but it's also Steve and Leslie and all the people, like, and you, Charlie, everybody who appreciates the values, and Bill Owens, who I, I expect would take my place when I move on, understands them. You know. That's what worries me, that we fall into the same rut that a lot of television news falls into, which is sort of pandering to an audience, trying to reach a demographic uh, with a particular kind of story that they're going to want to watch. You know, we don't do audience research to determine what stories to cover at 60 Minutes. We decide what we want to cover. And that's important because we don't, since we don't know what they might want us to cover, 
we have to work harder on making it compelling. It's one of those uh, things on Monday morning that I look forward to as someone who says, I didn't think I was going to be interested in that exactly. story, and that's I loved it. That's exactly what I look for in terms of an interview. I mean, yeah. you, what you want somebody to say is, I had no idea yeah. that I'd be interested in this. But what you brought out of that person, or what came out of that person, yeah. was a fascinating personality. And even though they did things I didn't know about, even though it would seem to be something I wasn't interested in, yeah. it became compelling because of storytelling. So that's a big part of it. And I think that uh, if you ask me what I worry about, it's just that we get caught up in the television business uh, the way uh, typical uh, um, chasing ratings, when that happens. It's not, it's, it goes against what we are about. And what's interesting about that dynamic is that we don't pander to particular audiences, but we're by far the most watched newscast in America. There's nothing even close. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's great to uh, be here. Jeff Fager, my friend, my colleague, my boss, many things. Uh, someone who I know I would turn to uh, at any time for advice. He's a man who's committed to great reporting, great storytelling. Uh, and as he has said in a recent conversation we had uh, before a live audience, uh, a program that respects the intelligence of the audience. We know that the audience has not spending the same amount of time we do in preparing something but we respect their intelligence, and we know uh, they expect us uh, to do our best. And that's what we try to do at 60 Minutes. This book, 50 Years of 60 Minutes, The Inside Story of Television's Most Influential News Broadcast. Jeff Fager, the executive producer, back in a moment. Drew Faust is here. She is the president of Harvard University. She was appointed in 2007, becoming the first woman to lead that institution. In June, Faust announced she would step down in July of 2018. During her tenure, she has increased diversity, expanded financial aid, and fostered greater inclusion on Harvard's campus. In announcing her resignation, President Faust described her time at Harvard as a privilege beyond words. We'll hear more about that. I'm pleased to have my friend Drew Faust back at this table. Welcome. Thank you so, so much, good Charlie. To see you. It's great to be here. Uh, you officially leave June 30th, mm -hmm. 2018. That's correct. Where will you be on July 1st, 2018? <laughs> In Cambridge? Great question. <laughs> Possibly on Cape Cod. Ah, we'll see. We'll yeah. see. Give me a sense of, of what it means to be president of Harvard and what it meant for you to be president of Harvard. Well, when I use those ter that term privilege beyond words, I was really thinking about the, the long scope of Harvard's existence, 1636, before the country right. was founded, and the way it has dedicated itself to what education can and must be for individuals and for the society in which that institution is located. So watching as a historian, which I also am, over the years, the the impact that Harvard has had, and then seeing the people that it attracts today and what's possible for them, and recognizing Meaning that- Meaning students? Students, faculty- Okay, everybody. People doing research, people studying for careers, people coming back to Harvard to refresh fields that they've been working in. Feeling that I have the opportunity to enable that, it just, it's, it's very humbling mm -hmm. and inspiring at the same time. What's great about a university? What's great about a university is that it's rather chaotic in its encouragement of curiosity and exploration and aspiration and human betterment. And people all believe in that, though they may go off in different directions to find out how best to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. And it's that I said it was chaotic, but in some sense it's also very ordered in that it's a kind of symphony of people yeah. working together towards common ends through very different With a certain kinds structure. Of, yeah. With, yeah. with a certain structure mm -hmm. and, a, and a certain uh, a certain sense of, of uh, it's up to us to make sure uh, that in a four-year experience at this place you have certain essential experiences. Mm -hmm for your mind, for your uh, soul, you know, for your sense of being a human being. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a rare sort of your first time away from home, mm -hmm. you know, and you're in a new place with new challenges uh, and the richness of the challenges, uh, the exposure to such uh, a variety of experience, challenges, intelligence, um, 
and learning is, is I think, a, a beautiful thing. So you're focusing in, in what you just said on the college, which is, of course, at the heart of the university. But I think it's important to remember it's not the only part it's of the university. It's a research facility. But when I, I think about the college in this day and age, we're making a choice to offer a residential experience yes. in an era when people could get so much information online. Oh so what is it about bringing people face to face that is the added value that is the special part of a residential university what experience? And I think that's very much at the heart of what you were saying, which is they are learning, students are learning in classrooms, in laboratories, in libraries, but they're also learning in how they interact with one another. And that is perhaps one of the most important lessons that they learn, which is we try to bring together in the college a class made up of people who are different in every possible way so that they have the maximum chance of educating one another and of introducing one another to experiences and points of view and backgrounds that one may never have encountered before. And that, to me, is the magic of the residential experience. If the leader of China said, I want to create a great university like Harvard, how long would it take him to do that? Well, there are many aspects to that, but I'd say one is that he would be challenged because he would not, I believe, like the kind of diversity of opinion and That's reflected on a university at Harvard. And difference that is essential to a great university. So they're inhibited in having a great university if there is an impediment to free expression, which we clearly know there is. They certainly have excellent universities that teach wonderful science, wonderful subject matter. They have brilliant scholars, and we have many exchanges and um, partnerships with um, places like Peking University or Tsinghua. But I think that element of freedom of expression is one that has to be at the heart of real learning because you've got to be able to challenge. Yeah. That's how we get to new places. That's why I asked the question. That very reason. Uh, it's essential to a university. Mm -hmm. And now today at certain universities we see uh, some effort to shout down free expression. I think that's a characteristic of our society as a whole right now. We are not very good at listening to one another. We're not very good at turning to rational and respectful argument. This is certainly reflected on college campuses. I think we have to work as hard as we possibly can in every way to sustain free speech, to make sure different points of view the are The conventional expressed. wisdom is that most universities are more liberal than conservative, or the majority of them, and therefore it's more directed against conservatives than moderates or liberals. That certainly um, can be the case, but we also ha can see disagreements in which one or another side shows intolerance of, of yeah. each other. I feel that part of creating the exchange of ideas that is so essential on a university campus is not just to permit speech, but to encourage an environment in which speech is welcomed and difference is sought mm -hmm. after. So we have to not just be passive in protecting speech, we have to be active in enabling speech and making sure, as I said before, that we have students with different points of view, mm -hmm. making sure that individuals understand that when they speak, they will be listened to and respected in their speech and that people aren't just shouting at the top of their lungs with their fingers in their ears. Mm -hmm. um, you set out, you said one of your primary goals was diversity. Mm -hmm. How have you done on that? We have greatly broadened our um, financial aid programs so that individuals from economic backgrounds of every sort can come to Harvard College. We have a financial aid program that enables students from families that make less than $65,000 a year to come with no parental contribution to tuition or room and board. That has changed the demographic of the uh, college class. I think that's a very important More dimension. More than 50% are non-white. This year, the entering class is majority minority. Yeah. Uh, we have many more international students across the university than we have had in previous decades. We also recognize that diversity is just a beginning, that it's not simply having people on a campus who are different in their identities, origins. And, it is. And it is making sure they feel that they are fully part of that experience, not just on the margins, not just tolerated, but fully own 
the mm. experience of being and, there. And, and not put in a ghetto, so to speak. Exactly. Uh, so we, we talk about diversity, inclusion, and belonging, mm. that people must feel this is their Harvard, too. It's not someone else's Harvard in which they have been permitted to have a small place. You mentioned the value of the on-campus experience. Uh, but are you seeing a, a, a dramatic increase in online education? We've been very engaged in that. We founded something in 2012 together with um, MIT called edX, which is an online learning platform. And in the years since then, we have through HarvardX put uh, more almost 100 Harvard courses online, and 6 million people have signed up and registered for these courses worldwide. One of the most exciting things. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? It is. And one dimension of this that I find so interesting is that of these registrants, about a third are teachers, which suggests that they're using this material so that they can share it with students. Yeah. And that makes it an it's exponential. A for a teacher. Yeah, an exponential. Um, dimension of, of this uh, opportunity through edX yeah. and Harvard X. I mean, you have a strong advocate for studying humanities. Why? Well, the very name humanities, it's about what it means to be human. It's about all those difficult dilemmas that are never going to be reduced to a formula or a number. What is life? What is death? What is love? Yeah. What is fear? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? And how have people asked and answered that question through time? Whether you approach that by reading literature from another place or era, whether you study the history of another place or era, you just amplify your own ability to be human by understanding how other people have been human. You say it is skills that slow us down. That's another aspect of the humanities. You have to contemplate, you have to back off, you have to be humble in face of what you don't know, you have to think deeply. And so many products of the humanities demand immersive attention, a work of art. We have a wonderful art history professor who assigns to her students the assignment of looking at a work of art for three hours. Now this generation of students find this astonishing. How could they possibly do something for three hours when they're used to tweeting and Snapchatting and all the rest of it? Yeah. But as they do it, they realize they see something at the end of hour one, and then by hour two, they see something else. It's a lesson in the, the rewards of slowing down and immersing oneself in observation and thought. You also suggest that the humanities teach you empathy. That's part of being human, too, to understand what other humans have seen and felt, and to be able to look at the world through their eyes. Mm. You've talked with me about this before, mm. but, but growing up in Virginia, uh, when did you want to be a historian? In a way, I was born a historian, because I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley, surrounded by relics of the Civil War, memories of the Civil War. My older brother, collected Civil War weapons on weekends. Our family would go to visit battlefields. Yeah. So I always had that sense of history being present and having its impact on our lives. It was also, I was a child in the 1950s and 1960s, and as the Civil Rights Movement began to, to emerge, Brown v. Board, I lived in Harry Bird's home county. He said Virginia should close its schools rather than integrate them. So it seemed that momentous things were going on around me that somehow were related to all these battlefields and what the Civil War was about. So that link between past and present was very strong in my consciousness as a young child. What is the unfinished business of the Civil War? We have not truly grappled with the issues of race in our country in a way that fully confronts the past. I'm always astonished today at how little we seem to know about slavery as a nation. And you'll remember uh, when Michelle Obama said that the White House had been built by slaves, there were all this uproar and objection to that. Well, it's a fact. Yeah. We should know that. And yet somehow, in my mind, it was underscored once again how little we have confronted our past when people rejected that. That's just like knowing the sky is blue or the sun's going to rise in the morning, in my view, and, and yet that isn't known. I mean, yeah. I mean I, you, you'll talk to some people mm. who 
um, and I don't want to put words in their mind, in their mouth, but Ta-Nehisi Coates and others and mm-hmm. Brian Stevens, and, um, that, you know, that we never have completely dealt with slavery. And in a sense, the scars of slavery uh, and how we see each other has never quite been come to grips with. I agree with that, and we've been confronting that in some ways at Harvard by asking what our past has been yeah. in relationship as to slavery university. as a university. And Georgetown did the same thing. Mm-hmm. And the striking aspect of Harvard asking this is that Harvard's in New England, and I think much of the nation has thought to itself, oh, well, New England had nothing to do with slavery. Well, slavery was legal in Massachusetts till 1783, and even after that, Uh, Harvard and other people in New England were deeply involved in trade and other kinds of connections to slave societies and economies that had a big impact on the wealth of New England. So as we begin to explore this at Harvard, we see a whole different aspect of Harvard's history. We placed a plaque on a a building at Harvard um, uh, almost two years ago now that had been the residence of Harvard presidents in the 18th century. And those Harvard presidents lived there with enslaved people. And we had in the records the names of four of these individuals. So we put their names up to remind ourselves and anyone who walks by the plaque that these are real people whose lives were stolen, who lived in this place that we've thought about more in terms of you know traditional mm-hmm. New England imagery of Puritans and maybe by the 19th century abolitionists. And that's how Harvard has traditionally looked at its history. But it has another history that has had an influence on how it evolved and another group of people who need to be acknowledged as contributing to what Harvard became over the years. Have we lost a sense of civility? We're certainly not exercising it adequately. I hope we haven't lost it. It's Beyond the speaker, I'm not talking about speaker. I'm just saying the capacity <clears throat> to to seek common ground. In elementary schools, children are still urged to be civil to one another. We at Harvard work very hard to build a community that is erected around civility. In many places in our society, we emphasize the significance of civility. But there are places where we're not emphasizing it enough. We can't be an adequate democracy if we can't talk to each other, if we can't argue honestly and respectfully, try to learn and revise our own opinions by listening to those of others, and improve our own thought by incorporating the ideas and insights of those with whom we have disagreed. Obviously, doing what I do and sitting at a table like this, you know, I have a profound belief. You're in, modeling. In, <laughs> yes. In civility, conversation, common ground. This whole uh, show's about civility, right? It's about right? that. Yeah. That's exactly what it's about, the capacity to talk to each mm-hmm. other. Yet at the same time, I'm also, I'm, I'm also um, a little bit concerned is that sometimes we think that's all that's necessary. Mm-hmm. That it is if we just talk about things, everything will be okay. You know, if we can it's, just yeah. engage, and it's not. There's something mm-hmm. else that's necessary beyond that, in addition to that. That's such an important point, because if you're in a place where individuals are feeling deprived or scorned or left aside or treated unfairly, you've got to go beyond talk. Right. You can begin with talk and then understand what actions need to come out of it. In our country today, there's growing inequality, as right. so many have documented. So many people who feel that they're not getting a fair shake from other people. Talk can help us understand the dimensions of that, the emotions that fuel it, but then we have to do something about it. Because it's hard to tell someone to be civil if you're withholding from them what they deserve and have a right to have. One of the things that I have discovered is that the idea of fairness is sort of deep within us. Mm -hmm. People really do recoil against what they consider unfair. unfair. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. You know, Uh, they're they're not, they're not, they're not, they don't object to people being rich. They object to something that it's not a fair system Mm -hmm. so that they have an opportunity to be rich. And that's why education is so important. Or whatever they want to be, you know. But that's why education is so important because I think that can be the vehicle of fairness, it's of the, offering people the opportunity. And the great mobilizer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, and I don't know how, you know, I mean, I think that's sort of what, and it has to be no, also, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to, to it's, it's something I grapple with, it, the idea of how do we go from conversation, mm-hmm. you know, 
and, and how do we speak to and understand uh, the experiences of others? So only if we can deeply understand their experience um, and have respect for their dignity mm -hmm. can we address mm -hmm. you know, what is deep within them. Mm -hmm. you know? The conversation's the foundation for action, not the substitute for it. Right. I'm so struck by our students these days because they have a real sense of purpose and obligation and need for service. They mm. want to fix the world Where that they that think from? we've I, messed up. I know that. <laughs> is, it, is it an observation of how the world's messed up or is it a sense of is, somehow do they have a, an altruistic gene in them or is it the, the environment that they have grown up in, whether it's parents or whatever, mm -hmm. education or whatever it is, has given them some sense of unacceptability. The way things are, are unacceptable. And I want to do something about it. Well, by the time I see them, they're 18 or older, right, right. in almost right, every right. case. And, and what smart I as see, hell. Yeah, and what I see them doing is identifying tools through which they can do this. Is it learning about public health, or is it going into law, or what is the way that I can bring this passion to make a better world into action through what means? And so watching them match themselves up with what it is that's going to enable that spirit, yeah. is that's part of the privilege that we were talking about at the beginning. I was just in London with a lot of smart people, young people, young people, and they were road scholars, and they were, you know, and they, but they were, and they were in medicine. They were doctors, young mm -hmm. doctors, mm -hmm. young till medical students. Students, but I mean, their passion uh, to use their science mm -hmm. for a larger good, mm -hmm. not just an individual, you know, person to person good, but a larger good, was stunning to yeah. me, you know, and 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 hopeful to me. Mm -hmm. It gave me great mm -hmm. enthusiasm yes. about the possibilities, um, because they were so. Um, engaged by the opportunity of making a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and so aware of all the things that are available to make a difference mm -hmm. in, in medicine and law and all the different fields in which they engage. Um, I was somewhere with a, a, a major executive uh, in America. Uh, and it was, it was Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO mm -hmm. of J.P. Morgan. Harvard alum. Harvard Business alum. School. Baker Scholar. Uh, and Jamie was so very proud of the fact, you know, that 50 percent of, of his principal executives, and I want to get this right, were women. Mm -hmm. So where are we in terms of coming to grips with both opportunity and also uh, eliminating all bias? We have a, a long, long way, way to go. To go. <laughs> I if, go back to your mother who said to you, it's, it's a man's, man's world. world. And uh, the sooner you figure that out, the happier you'll be. That's what she said to that's you. That's what she said to me constantly when yeah. I was a child. But we have a long way to go. Tell me what, how we get there. Well, we get there by, again, as we were saying about race, we have to confront the kinds of prejudices, assumptions, inhibitions that have limited women's opportunity. We have seen all these instances in recent days of sexual harassment mm -hmm. charges in a variety of fields. We're learning that workplaces have been difficult for women. We've got to address that. We have to challenge assumptions about women being less able in whatever ways or less rational or not good at science or not good at whatever. Um, marginalizes them in their aspirations. We have to provide child care so that we still traditionally it is the woman who is ultimately responsible for the child's care and women drop out of the workforce because it's so hard to get child care. There are just so many structural as well as attitudinal dimensions of moving women forward. And where is the resistance? Is it cultural? Is it it's cultural in part, it's um, financial in part. Childcare is expensive. Mm. We as a nation don't do enough about it. It's um, sometimes just ignorance that people mm. don't recognize 
the things they're saying or the things they're doing and the impact it has on limiting yeah, others' exactly. opportunities. Uh, not being able to put yourself in the other person's mm -hmm, shoes. Mm -hmm. If you were going to give a speech about your 11 years, what would be your first paragraph? What, what have you learned? <clears throat> it's a last lecture question. <laughs> My speech would be, in this moment especially, about how what I always knew about universities from having attended college and then being a professor for 25 years has been so reinforced by moving beyond being in just one part of the university and seeing the breadth of human betterment and possibility that universities embody and the importance of knowledge and facts and analysis to social good, to democracy, to the best of humankind. And I'd be saying that at a time when facts are losing their force as determinants of how we act and how we judge and how we move well, forward. That's scary. It's very, very scary. scary. It's very scary. Yeah, is that a Trumpian reality? It's a national reality at the moment as we compartmentalize our news consumption so that we never listen to views that differ from our own as we lead with emotion because it's so much easier not to have to hear difficult things. There's so many ways in which this is becoming a part of our social fabric. And if, in fact, um, my, your second speech is going to be a bit like uh, when presidents leave and Dwight Eisenhower made the famous be warned of the military industrial compact. I'd say be warned of abandoning facts. That would be warned of abandoning facts. Mm -hmm. um, and abandoning the kind of hard deliberation that is required in order to stay focused on facts. I mean, Harvard's motto has been very toss for a long time. What a great motto. That's truth. That's truth. what it's about. That's what we have to commit ourselves to. It's not always easy to face truths, as I think one can see in one's daily life as well as in much mm -hmm. larger dimensions. But that's what's at the heart of it. I love having you here, and I love you, and I thank you for coming. Thank you, Charlie. Drew Faust, president of Harvard until June 30th. 2018. Back in a moment. We begin with the president's trip to China. He returned on Wednesday from his 12-day trip to Asia. The White House described the five-country tour as a major success. President Trump claimed progress on trade and North Korea. In a speech, the president said, America is back. Joining me now is Ian Bremmer. He is the president of Eurasia Group. I'm pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Charlie, good to see you. Uh, let's look, talk about the president in China. Tell me what he accomplished and, and what the positive and the negatives are about this trip. Well, didn't make any big mistakes at all. Um, all of the bilateral meetings went smoothly. He stayed on talking points. He was treated very well. What went best, I would say, first, the fact that Prime Minister Abe really feels like he still needs America, needs Trump. And the two men actually have a lot of charisma. Uh, secondly, Trump was able to talk a fair amount about this new Indo-Pacific concept, national security driven, not about democracies really or human rights, but India, Australia, Japan, all countries that are worried about China's military capabilities, which are growing quite a bit in their backyard. And Trump is very happy to align himself uh, as a consequence. So that's a useful thing. Um, but let's be clear, when he says America's back, I mean, I was there. Uh, I met with a lot of the leaders uh, at the APEX summit in Vietnam. And it's very clear that the role of the U.S. president on the ground with this trip is much more limited today than it has been historically. How so? Uh, well, the biggest thing that came out of the entire trip was moving forward a preliminary agreement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership 11, which is the deal that, of course, the United States pulled out of. 
Um, that's uh, the, the trade. They uh, moved forward without the United States. Just, they did. They yeah. did. And uh, also, the uh, you know, everyone is focused on Xi Jinping, on China, and it's reacting to what the Chinese are doing, the checks that they're writing, the policy pronouncements they're make, making. They're the ones that are saying they're going to be a leader on global climate today. Trump obviously is not. Countries in the region care about that. They're the ones that say they want to be a leader on global trade. Now, They'd much rather have the United States, but if the U.S. is pressing everyone bilaterally on a more fair deal for America, these countries feel like China's who you listen to. So, I mean, the reality is everyone now understands that the way to make Trump happy is just tell him how awful, how, how awesome he is. Just tell how him awesome. how awesome, not awful. Tell him how awesome he is. But privately, these countries tell me, these foreign ministers, these heads of state, uh, tell me that um, they believe that Trump is the least fit for purpose president that they've seen. And they're not paying, taking him as seriously or paying as much attention to him. And that's a real problem. For so America what is power. it about Trump that suggests that to them? Well, I mean, there's the obvious, right? There's the, the fact that he doesn't really know much about national security and he says things that have to be reined back in by his advisors all the time. Uh, but then there's the general ideology of America first, which, you know, I mean, on national security, I would say whatever Trump says, the reality has been more modest. It has been much more, in fact, if you look at the alignment of the national security advisor, the secretary of defense, the secretary of state, what you see are national security policies that don't look like Obama. They look kind of Clintonian and they feel comfortable with that. But on trade, on values, on climate, the reality of Trump's policies outside the United States are antithetical to those of American allies, literally antithetical. And it's, it's coming at a time where China Both in has, Asia and Europe. Absolutely. And it's coming at a time where the Chinese have, it's, but it's more important in Asia because in Europe, you know, it's who else is there really to play with? No one big. In Asia, you have the most powerful leader that we've seen from China since Mao. Is he now the most powerful leader in the world? Uh, well, you saw that with the Economist yeah, magazine. The Economist magazine said Absolutely. I, I think he probably is. I do. I think he's consolidated an enormous amount of power uh, over his first five years as culminated in the 19th Party plenum. Um, it's interesting. If you ask me um, what Trump's biggest international accomplishment has been in terms of impact since he's become president, it's probably that he facilitated Xi Jinping's speech at that plenary, which I consider the most important speech on the global stage since Gorbachev uh, declared the dissolution of the Soviet Union. That, indeed. Um, because he announced that China wanted to play and would play and could play a huge role in the world and intended to. It was willing at long last to live up to everybody's pronouncement of what it was becoming. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think that if Trump weren't president, Xi Jinping would not have given that speech yet. Mm. So it's directly impacted by the fact that he sees an American president that provides a lot of space. Did the president make <clears throat> any progress on North Korea uh, in trying to get the Chinese uh, to do more? He did some interesting trying to things. get the North Koreans to resist test. So North Korea was virtually not an issue um, in the headlines when uh, during Trump's trip in Asia. So the Asian newspapers didn't talk much about it. And that's because Trump's statements on North Korea for those constituents that for whom it really matters, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Chinese, was so much softer, so much willing to countenance diplomacy and an offer and from the North Koreans. And that's what they wanted to hear. And even the Japanese wanted to hear that. Absolutely. We're here in the United States. It's all fire, fury, and little rocket man. And yes, he did put that tweet out, of course, saying I didn't, I'd call him small, short and fat, but, uh, but I'm not going to. But he did that after he left Japan and South Korea safely out of, uh, you know, sort of a short-term test range. Um, and uh, the North Koreans were unlikely to respond to that. But the point is, have the Chinese agreed to do more? Yes. But the most interesting piece on this is that when Trump was pushed, he said the Chinese are doing more and the Russians could do more, but I'm prevented from getting them to help me because of my constraints in the United States from the fake news and Mueller and everything else. So in other words, Trump used the lack of cooperation on Russia to turn back and blame the Americans because he knows he can't get it done. Russia's trading more with North Korea this year, 70% more than they did last year. Russia clearly what is... Does it say, what does it sell them? 
Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's definitely some technology there. There's definitely some uh, f finished goods. I mean, it's cheap manufacturers and stuff that otherwise the North Koreans don't have. Um, it's nothing enormously important, at least not that we've tracked. But the point is, it's stuff that the North Koreans need. The Chinese were squeezing them. If the Russians suddenly become an outlet, what exactly have we accomplished? And this is the guy that Trump wants to be so close to. I think the, for those people that have been saying that we are close to a preemptive strike on North Korea, this trip should have given them uh, the ability to take a couple steps back from the cliff and breathe a little bit. Let's talk about Saudi Arabia and tell me what, what's happening over there and, and what is MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, doing? Or will there be some kind of uh, blowback? So I feel better about what he's doing domestically than I do about what he's doing in the region. Okay, talk about both. So Domestically? Uh, at home, uh, the Both of them have popular support, don't they? Yes, uh, though, uh, you know, if you're spending money and um, people are getting killed uh, in Yemen, for example, that's, that's a little more divisive inside the kingdom. Um, Lebanon more divisive in the region. And, you know, while Trump provides support for MBS to do whatever he wants, as well as Jared Kushner, um, this is where you've seen the biggest divide inside the United States with Mattis, Secretary of Defense, with Tillerson, Secretary of State, on virtually everything they've done in the region. Right? They're not aligned on that stuff, and I mean, that's interesting. State and defense are not aligned? State and defense are, are aligned, are but they're the not bias. aligned with Trump and Jared, who don't, again, have the experience. Where was the basic split? Well, basic split, for example, in uh, getting uh, the Lebanese prime minister, uh, Saad Hariri, to resign, which, you know, the How American... How did the Saudis do that? If well, th that's he, what they did. He's a dual national. And uh, my understanding is they brought him back and they said that if you don't resign, we're going to pursue some charges against you um, and on financial irregularities. And uh, they do have an enormous amount of influence. They've effectively been the bankers for the <laughs> Sunni portion uh, of Lebanese elites. Um, but to go back to your initial question, how's he doing? Right. How's MBS doing? Uh, domestically, I think he's doing pretty well. So he's gone after a lot of princes, a number of ministers, former ministers, a lot of elites who have for a long time been treating the organizations they have control over as their personal piggy banks. They've made a lot of money. And it's very clear that the Saudi government, with given what's happening with oil, uh, are not going to be, and, and the exploding population, won't be able to continue to afford them that lifestyle. So the fact that Mohammed bin Salman, he hasn't executed him, he hasn't thrown him in jail, he's thrown him in the Ritz-Carlton and the overflow go into the Courtyard Marriott, not mm -hmm. as nice, but they're getting turned down service, and he's trying... But are they allowed to have conversation with people on the outside? Uh, m no, I don't believe they are, but, um, but he is, he's, right now he's working out, look, there's going to be a new sheriff, you're going to take assets and bring them back to Saudi Arabia. You're going to operate differently. But my expectation is that most of them will do that, and then they'll be freed, and they'll, they'll be back in so society. So what does he want from Prince Awali to take one? Well, Awali is a slightly different character because unlike many of these other princes, Awalid is himself a kind of irrepressible ego, and he's a voice of reform. So he is seen as a potential competitor to MBS in a way that others are less so. And Awalid's father has been quite public in his opposition to MBS. Awalid himself was in the early days when he was promoted to be crown prince, though he's been quiet more recently. So I, it's not clear to me that Awalid is, is going to be suddenly cleaned off Okay, on, foreign, on foreign policy, in terms of Yemen, in terms of, of what he's doing with respect to Lebanon uh, and trying to take on Hezbollah. Well, one, just one more point okay. on domestic, which is that beyond this anti-corruption thing, which is pretty popular in the country, the decision to let women drive, the decision to try to reform political Islam is so critical to the Saudis in any way diversifying their economy. So he may not have be able to execute it effectively, but these are clearly things that all of us should want him to get right. And, and I, I think that, you know, again, if, if, he, if he doesn't do it, no one else is going to. So we should be rooting for that. But your, the international point, the Iranians are, as you and I have spoken about before, ascendant in the region. They're doing better everywhere, much more influence. 
and the Saudis are pushing back, and they pushed back in terms of squeezing. So where are the Iranians doing so well? Well, uh, you think about uh, Syria, where the Russians and the Iranians and Hezbollah, together with Assad, have effectively imposed an outcome that they want. And um, the war is over. That war is mostly over, yeah. And Assad won. And Assad, the Russians and the Iranians have won. And the Saudis are not so happy about that. Um, in Yemen, um, you know, you have the uh, Houthi rebels uh, who have significant support from Iran. You have now missile that was launched uh, at the Riyadh airport that uh, the Saudis say came from Iran, and they've closed down the borders. There's a massive humanitarian crisis in Yemen as a consequence of that. In Lebanon, the belief was that Prime Minister Hariri was um, not able to um, have uh, as much influence over governance and over what Hezbollah was doing because of greater influence so, by and, the And Iranians. Iran, because of Syria now, will have a, a route to to a uh, land route to Lebanon. Correct. And then also you have the Qatar situation where the Saudis and the Emirates went after Qatar in part. They said that because... Where does that stand? It, it's at, at best frozen and potentially additional sanctions to be levied by the Saudis and the Emirates against Qatar. But certainly we're not moving towards any possibility of rapprochement. So the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation so Council, is going to... Qatar will, will survive this? Sure, they have a lot of money. And they can wait these guys out for a long time. And Plus, the Americans the will still base. support them. Yeah. Exactly. And the Turks have more military troops on the ground in Qatar now, too. Yeah. But, you know, unlike... And they have Iran in terms of an Iran who's in, given them uh, access. Yes, yes. And so, and they have joint uh, gas fields that they're exploiting and all the rest. So it would be hard for them to cut them off. But, you know, if, if you look at the domestic side for the Saudis... Mohammed bin Salman, you know, is doing something that, yes, there may be a lot of folks internally that are having a problem with it, but ultimately it's popular with the population, and the world wants him to succeed. Internationally, geopolitically, the Saudis are losing everyday influence in their own region. Okay, because... Iran is winning. Because America's doing a little less. The Iranians, the Russians are playing a geostrategic role. It's problematic. Uh, a lot of the Middle East is becoming a little more unstable. And you're mostly worried about Iran. And you're mostly worried about Iran, about your own internal stability, right, about right. terrorism. I mean, there, there are 10 things you're worried about before you deal with Israel-Palestine. By the way, the Israelis have done a really good job at defending their borders. The Israelis have done a really good job at human surveillance, at cyber surveillance, which the Saudis would like to learn a lot from. So I, I think that there's going to be more cooperation between those countries going forward. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, Charlie. Thank you. Ian Bremmer, thank you for joining us. See you next time. For more about this program and early episodes, visit us online at pbs.org and charlierose.com.